Hello, and welcome to People in Profit, where we look at how business shapes our world. I'm Kate Moody. Coming up, it's the most prestigious award in the field, the Nobel Prize in Economics. But just what is contract theory all about, and how does it impact our daily lives? More people have joined the middle class around the world, but the riches aren't being shared. We speak to the author of the UN's latest report on inequality and vulnerability. And the Brexit bump. Tourism in the UK has risen and foreign visitors are spending more money as the pound sterling continues to lose value. First, it's the highest level of achievement in economics. The British-born Oliver Hart and Finnish Bengt Holstrom were named the Nobel Economics Laureates for their work on contract theory, a fundamental principle in the business world. The men are professors at Harvard and MIT, respectively, and will split the $900,000 prize. Hart said he was thrilled to share the honor with his fellow academic. The thing that's nice about receiving a prize like this is you think maybe the work really has had some value, or people, somebody has said, you know, it is good. Because I, I, you always worry about it. I mean, we are, I think most academics are worries. You know, you, you always think, well, you know, maybe it's, uh, I didn't quite get where I should have. And, and that may still be true, by the way, but at least I, I guess I got somewhere. So what is their work all about, and why does contract theory matter to you? Delana D'Souza has been finding out. Delana? Thanks, Kate. Well, it's important to first note that contract theory doesn't state what makes a good contract, and many elements were widespread before they were formalized in the theory. Contract theory is seen as a modern way to write and design a contract. It offers practical advice for achieving the best outcome, impacting economics and social sciences. Now, contract theory is prevalent in a range of areas, including car insurance, insurance policies, executive pay, and the provision of public services. Let's begin with car insurance. For decades, such contracts avoided full cover in the event of an accident. What contract theory suggests is that these excess payments make drivers more cautious. They tend to avoid reckless driving and even lock their car doors when they otherwise wouldn't. The theory is also at the heart of executive pay packages to encourage CEOs to stick to their side of a bargain. Stock options will only be awarded based on a company's performance performance. Work by Bent Holstrom shows how it's better for shareholders to dish out rewards based on how rivals in the same sector are doing. Also, CEOs can't be rewarded just because market conditions are favorable, and this removes any element of luck when deciding pay. In the public sector, Holstrom and Oliver Hart help create tools to determine whether teachers, healthcare workers, and prison guards should be paid fixed or performance-based salaries. They highlighted the focus on cost reductions were too strong among private contractors, expressing particular concern on privately run prisons in the United States. This pushed the U.S. Justice Department to recently announce it would no longer use private facilities. Kate, back to you. Talana, thank you so much for that. The International Monetary Fund and World Bank have been sounding the alarm on economic inequality. Global growth has benefited too few people for too long, and more people are falling behind. That same message has now been echoed in a new report by the UN Development Program. Entitled Progress at Risk, it highlights the breakdown of social safety nets in Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Turkey, noting that the middle class has tripled in the past 15 years, but many of them are struggling to find fixed employment or access basic health and education services. Now for more on this, we can speak to Ben Slay, Chief Economist at the UN Development Program. Mr. Slay, thanks so much for speaking to us. Now, one of the more shocking figures to come out of this report is that one third of the workforce in the region that was studied is engaged in either informal or vulnerable jobs. How did that come about and what impact has it had on the region? It came about because of the transition from socialism to market economies. It used to be prior to 1990 in the countries we're looking at that almost all people worked in state enterprises and those enterprises worked according to plans which required full employment of the workforce. That began to change with the transition to markets that occurred in the, during the early 1990s. Uh, in some cases, fortunate people have gotten decent jobs in private companies that work in the formal sector and pay decent salaries. But for others, uh, the alternatives were either working in the public administration, where oftentimes the pay is not very good, or working in the informal private sector. And in some cases, this involves things like petty trade, or working in subsistence agriculture, or working as a labor migrant. And all of those types of employment uh, are really not decent. Uh, they don't pay as much, and they 
oftentimes have a less social protection than would be the case than if these workers had employment in the formal sector. Now, Turkey in particular has been in focus in recent years as more and more refugees flood there. Has that made the problem more acute? Well, Turkey has for many years had a very large informal sector that has been driven primarily by uh, rural to urban migration within Turkey of Turks leaving rural areas and going to cities like uh, Istanbul, Ankara, or other places uh, to work. And so uh, well before the developments in Syria, there has been a, a large numbers, millions of workers who are working to some extent informally in the Turkish economy. Now, with the uh, two million uh, Syrian refugees, uh, at first they did not have access to legal jobs in the formal sector. That is now beginning to change. We should add that most of the Syrian uh, refugees in Turkey are uh, not working. They are staying in uh, uh, refugee camps, special facilities that have been set up for them, paid for primarily by the Turkish government, and there are pretty good conditions there. But clearly, the addition of hundreds of thousands of Turks, uh, excuse me, of Syrians to the t Turkish labor markets, especially in the border regions, has had an impact uh, on the labor markets there and has sometimes exacerbated tensions. On the other hand, the Turkish government has also tried to create employment opportunities for the Syrians in ways that have not disadvantaged the local labor force as well. Now, your report also says that about $65 billion is leaving the region illegally each year. Where is that money from and where is it going? Well, it is now recognized globally that illicit financial flows are a major problem. They're a major problem in developing countries. They're a major problem in developed countries. And all countries have agreed that uh, these flows should be reduced, both because they finance criminality and because oftentimes these funds, if they were captured, could finance legitimate budget activities, be this social protection, education, or whatever. The numbers that we use in this report come from a, an initiative called Global Financial Integrity, which measures different types of illicit financial flows for many different countries all over the world. And we chose their data because they were the longest in terms of time series and the fullest coverage for the countries in which we're working. The $65 billion is an average annual figure that comes from estimates of misinvoiced trade flows. That is to say, of over-invoicing of exports and under-invoicing of imports, so as to essentially have uh, uh, camouflaged uh, capital outflows and uh, to avoid import duties as well. So this does not include Russia or the new member states of the EU. It includes countries like Turkey, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Moldova, uh, et cetera. Now, women in particular are less likely to have stable employment. How can that be rectified? We're talking about a specific uh, regional dimension of, of what is a, a global problem. But what we do see in many of the countries that this report focuses on is that compared to uh, Europe and other places, labor force participation rates for women are very low. And that's in part because the governments have not made investments in social care infrastructure, such as providing subsidies for private uh, daycare for children or state-run uh, daycare uh, facilities. And we estimate, or we actually quote estimates made by Turkish researchers that in Turkey, for example, it's much more cost effective to provide jobs by investing in social care infrastructure than it is to uh, provide jobs by investing in big transport infrastructure projects. It hires not only more women, but more people in general, and those jobs tend to be higher quality jobs, which also generate more taxes for the state budgets and help to pay for themselves. Ben Slay of the UN Development Program, thank you so much for speaking to us. Now, Brexit proceedings will begin by the end of March 2017, and the government appears to be leaning towards a hard Brexit, that is prioritizing immigration control over access to the European market. The announcement has sent the pound sterling into a downward spiral, trading around its lowest level in decades and raising broader concerns about how the UK economy will fare once it leaves the European Union. Here's what former World Bank President Robert Zellick told France 24 about the sterling slump.
Well, it's been rather significant, and I think that's a statement about some of the uh, sort of uncertainty of investors. Um, some people have been surprised about the fact that the British economy has performed okay, uh, uh, and I think part of that is the momentum that George Osborne and the team had going in. Some of it's the actions of the Bank of England. But we'll have to see over time whether that continues. And so I'm a little worried that other than the currency, there's a bit of a complacency, and I don't think it's justified. But the weak currency isn't bad news for everyone. It's contributed to a record jump in tourist arrivals, as Charles Pellegrin explains. Is London now an affordable destination for tourists? Ian and Derek often visit from New York, and they feel like they suddenly have more spending power. The past couple times we were looking at restaurants that, you know, 50 pounds or something was a big, big hit, and now it's a lot less. So, you know, maybe another, maybe another bottle of wine, maybe another dessert, maybe another drink here and there. The UK's tourism board explains the fall in sterling following the Brexit has been a boost. In a period post-referendum, post-Brexit, this is the shining star industry that really is benefiting from, amongst other things, a weakening of the pound. In July, right after the referendum, the number of visitors to the UK went up 2 percent, close to 4 million compared to the same month last year. The depreciation of the pound against the dollar to its lowest level in three decades has been especially good news for American tourists. Good news is we're better value than we've been for 30 plus years for Americans, our biggest single market. They spend three billion pounds a year here. So Americans seeing this as being a value story is good. This has also been good for domestic tourism, as Britons are finding it too expensive to travel abroad. Last year, they spent close to 20 billion pounds on overnight trips, up 8% on 2014. Continental Europeans are also expected to come rushing in in the coming months as the euro grows stronger than the pound. Right on time for holiday sales. That's it for this People in Profit. If you have any questions about the stories we've been covering, you can get in touch on Facebook at France 24 Business, or you can tweet me at Kate A. Moody. Until next time, thanks for watching.